Hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, um, we have a, another serverless topic to talk about today. Um, there's some wonderful work going on at Solo around um, some new projects that Edith Levin, who is the founder and CEO of Solo, um, is going to talk about today. I'll let her introduce herself and um, her projects and um, their offerings, and we can um, have some chat in the chat as usual, and there'll be live Q&A at the end. So without any further ado, I'm going to let Edith um, introduce herself and talk about what she's been doing, what she's been up to the past year or so. So take care and take it away. Thanks so much. So thanks so much for having us. Uh, so my name is Edith, like we said. Uh, I'm the CEO and the founder of, Cor of uh, Solo.io. Uh, this is a small company based in Boston. And basically what we're doing is we're doing a lot of stuff that related to innovation, open source, and we ecosystem, serverless, and so on. But we also have our own, uh, you know, a product that's solving a real enterprise problem. So if we should just start going and, and explain. I'll explain you why, what we're doing and why we're doing what we do. So, okay, so this is the way I see the ecosystem today. There is monolithic application. Um, there are actually, this is most of the enterprise, right? There, this is where usually the core business, this is an application that people was building for the last 12 years or so. Um, they're going to, um, you know, to manage them by some something like Ansible, for instance, from like that, and then they're going to need to uh, to to uh, tools to actually uh, monitor. So they're going to use some APM product in order to get the metrics, and they're going to use something like Splunk to get the logging. And most likely, this architecture is an SOA, service-oriented architecture. But there is also the new world, which is the microservices, which most of the enterprise probably most likely want to move because it's faster. Um, and then there, in these microservices are going to, to manage by something like OpenShift, right? Um, and they're going to, uh, you know, manage that, the stage, the deployment, and so on. And they will still need you to use some tools in order to make sure that, you know, it's, it's always running and the metrics is working. So we do use something like Prometheus for metrics, for instance, just because the scale have to be much, much, much larger. Um, they use something like open tracing because now it's all about distributed application. And when it's distributed application, it's really, really hard to get the stage of the microservices and the logging. You're getting a blob of log and it's hard to understand who's belong to you. So they will do something like open tracing, who basically giving a, a, a transactional ID and that way it's aggregating all the right logs. And, and that will be microservices. But there is also a very interesting ecosystem called serverless. Um, most likely right now, I think that most of the people are actually running it in production. We run it in some of the cloud provider, like for instance, AWS or Google and so on, uh, which is the main purpose of actually creating this movement was the gluing of the services. So now it will be running because you most likely will run on AWS or some, some other cloud, you most likely they will manage your, your function, your Lambda. And therefore you will use their tools like CloudWatch for metrics and X-Ray for logging. And all this architecture is really, really big in event-driven because mainly it's gluing the, gluing the services, which means that every time that someone puts something in the service or creates some event, those functions will run. It's also a very, very um, economic uh, is solution because you're paying only for what's running. So there is all this system and then the enterprise are looking at that. So this is to but the question is how to do that. It's really, really hard. So let's see what is the option that those enterprises have today. So the first option that they have is just not to move, right? I mean, this is hard. And, you know, if something is working, the monolithic is working, maybe they shouldn't move. But the problem with that is that this core monolithic application, the business use case, it's really, really hard to add new feature. Monolithic is really, really uh, complicated. Usually it's spaghetti code. And it's really hard to, to, to understand the system and add features. And then after it, after you're doing, you need to deploy a monolithic application, which is another problem. So it's really, really hard. So again, they can stay there, but then if one of their competitors did move, they probably move much faster than them. So they will lose. The option number two that they have is, and this is done by a lot of enterprise, is basically they're saying, look, no worries. We're going to hire these, hire these crazy good people, and they're going to take Every green application that we need to do, every new application that we need to write, they will write it on the new architecture. 
as a server class. But we're still going to keep the monolithic application in monolithic ecosystem because it's just, you know, again, it's hard, right? So the problem with that is that in the end of the day, you know, you're still running your core application, your core business your application that you actually invest most of the time in, and it's your core business in a monolithic. And to add feature to this, it's still slow. So even if you do some green application, you know, on the new technology, still, you know, it's not really helping you because this is usually most likely only a support application. And of course, you're kind of like creating a silo team right now, right? Because you have those guys who's application and the other guys who's doing the new stuff. And there is a huge competition between them. Those guys are continuing features. It's, it's like, it, it's creating a lot of mess. And of course, different tooling and so on. Okay. So option number three, and again, there is a lot of enterprises who's trying to do that, is basically let's blow up the, micro, the, the monolithic application. Big bang refactoring. We're going to destroy the monolithic application and every feature that exists in this monolithic application, we will write it in either serverless or microservices. So this is a really, really nice idea, but to be fair, it's never working. It's really, really, really hard to do that. This is like, as I said, like it could be like eight years of application with spaghetti code, which a lot of logic built into. And now to go and refactor everything is just hard. It's really, really hard. And, uh, and, and therefore, a lot of the people are just quitting in the middle. They're trying this, uh, these things and then eventually just, just stopping in the middle. But let's say that they did succeed that and then they refactor the application. It's probably taking them between a year or two. On this year or two, you didn't get any new. Basically, it's like I'm renovating this room, but everything I'm doing is basically piping behind the, room, the, the wall. So again, not the best solution. So the, so the question is, what is the right solution? Because people doing it, right? I mean, people like, um, like uh, Twitter and people like Cliff, they actually migrate their monolithic application to microservices. And the way they did it is basically by putting something on top of it. So basically extend the monolithic application to feature in the microservice and serverless, but treat it as one application and then gradually refactor the monolithic application. So when I looked at this, I said to myself, this is great. The question is how to do it the most seamlessly. And what I noticed is that the smallest unit of compute that share between all these things is basically function. If you think about it, basically, every monolithic application or microservice application has an expose API, and I can treat them as a function. So if I'm doing this and I can actually break, which I'm not really breaking, but actually break, uh, the, the monolithic application and microservices to function, I can actually do something like this. I'm calling it hybrid app, but it could be called any composing application and so on, which is the ability to actually put all the new features and uh, extend the monolithic application to, to microservice and serverless, and then gradually move. Um, hope that makes sense. Uh, so if we can do this, now it's interesting. Now we're getting a fast delivery. Um, you always moving to the right target. Um, and, and you know, and you gradually moving it in the smallest unit of compute, which means that you don't refactor everything, you're just taking piece by piece and moving it in your, in your spare time. Um, so I think that the best way to understand the vision is just by showing it. So I will show you a quick demo. Um, okay, so I have here a monolithic application. This is not even mine, actually. This is a uh, written by Pivotal, as you can see. It's a spring, spring application. It's the low word of the spring application, basically, right? So it's the pet stores. And I can actually show you the code. The code is the Pivotal code. It didn't change it. It's really an application that we, you know, we just took and install. So we put it running, actually. What we did is lift and shift. We basically took it, lift and shift it, and put it on open, on open shift. So now we have that running there. And this is a Java code, right? So this is also a Java code, as you can see, it's all working and fantastic. And then when I'm coming to the vets, what I see is that there is two call, and I really want to add another one. And I want to add the location call. The problem with that is that I have a new engineer, and I really want him to add it. So what this guy needs to do, because he's new, is to understand the application, to go figure out what's going on in this spring application that is really, really kind of like hard and not really trivial to understand. You need to add a function. Right, the actual functionality for that, for bringing the location. You need to test it, the functionality. You need to regression test it. You need to deploy a monolithic application, which is never easy. So all of this in order to add one column. Or what we can do is what I did here, I wrote a microservices in Go, again, running on open tracing, and open 
And how I'm doing is basically going directly to the database and just stacking all the information that I need for this page. So now the only thing I need to do with glue, which is this UI, is as you can see, already discover everything that's running on open tray on open a shift. So you can see all the application that running glue is running on open shift and so on. And and the bed store that we just saw, even the, the microservices in Go I already basically put it, install it, you know, I deploy it on uh, on OpenShift. And now there is the routes. So the only thing that I said right now is that everything that's coming to this domain need to go to this monolithic application. What we're going to do right now, we're just going to add another route. And what we're going to do is we'll say everything that's going to vets.html for any type of request, what we want to do is to run these microservices. Okay, that's it, very simple. So right now, everything will go to this, but if someone will go to a vet.html, it will go to my microservices and go. So let's go right now back to the application and see what happening. This is a Java application. This is the Java. But when I'm clicking here, this is already the go. Now notice how quick it was. And the reason it's quick is because the technology of Envoy and everything that we're doing with it. So I will explain in a second. So now let's look at this. The contact is not working as well. So I can go and ask my engineer to fix it, but let's for fun of it, just add a function here. So let's run, run a Lambda from AWS every time that this one is fixed. So I'm going to come here and to glue. And what I will do is this. I will first need to add an upstream to basically manage the AWS. So I'm clicking here and I can see it's really simple. I'm just doing AWS. I'm choosing the type of AWS, we're supporting others. And what I'm doing is I'm going to choose the US East one because that's where my function is running. It's already discovered the secret. And again, I will explain why when we were drilling into the technology. And I'm going to actually ask it. What did you see is a minute I did that, it already went and discovered all the functions that are running there. So basically on AWS, East one, I have all those functions. So now the only thing that I really need to do is to go back to the route and click new routes. I will come here and I will do slash contact HTML, which is the page that I want to fix. And I will say every time that it's it, I want you to go to AWS and run this Lambda for me. And by the way, Lambda is always returning JSON, but I really want to show it in, you know, in the HTML because I want to show it in the browser. So we created a transformation that exactly to do that. Today you can do it only with the AWS um, a gateway, which will cost you quite a lot of money. So we did that. So again, the application, everything is going to the Java monolithic application. I didn't touch it. I didn't need to redeploy it. It's all there. It's not even my code. On top of it, I extend it or I change it to go to this route when I wanted to do it, my Go microservices. And now also going to, I told him that if someone clicking on, on contact, I want you to go to AWS and run this function. So now let's go if it's, let's see that's actually worked. So again, this is the Java. This is the Java. This is the Go microservices. And I will go to the contact and hopefully it will work and it works. So I just spin up a Node.js function in AWS. And I can go actually, all of this is open in order to show you that I'm not lying, but I'm not lying. So this is basically the hybrid app solution. And again, we can extend for more, 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 more functionality. And, and, and now let's drill and understand what we actually did that. So let's, check. let's go to the presentation back. Okay. So when we designed glue and glue basically called like this, it's because we're planning to glue the environment and the technologies, right? Um, what we don't, what we, we, we pay attention is to three things that was important to us, design. One of them, it was important to us, you know, like every API I get where we basically centralize everything, right? So we centralize the security, the observability and the traffic, right? So you have one place that you can manage it for the ecosystem, which is great. The second thing that was uh, important for us, so as, oops, sorry. So as you can remember, we talked about taking all this monolithic application and cut it to to function. The reason we wanted to do that is because this is the smallest unit of compute, which means that it will be easier for me to take something small and refactor than to take something big and refactor. So what we did, we basically make Envoy, we enhance Envoy to, to basically route on the function level. So we're discovering the function and we'll be able to route on the function level. So all the great functionality that Envoy is giving us, we're getting it on the function level, security, transformation, um, 
canary deployment and so on. And again, I will drill into more, but that's one of our core um, uh, design, which is everything on the function level. The, the last thing that we did is by actually by doing this, we decouple everything. We, we will decouple the front end from the back end. And I think this is a really, really important thing because every proxy that exists is, is, is routing on the, on the service level, which means that the backend have to have some, you know, the backend format or, or, or design have to be relevant to the client. With, with Glue, you totally, de totally de uh, decouple it, which means that there is, you know, we, we have a transformation filter that transforms it. So you can actually take and, you know, use a regular client to call GLPC, right? And so on. So it's really, really giving you kind of like a multiplexer, if you like. No matter which, which portable you're talking, you will get the others. So now, let's, because right now it sounds like it's really kind of like, besides the function level, it's not, you know, it's API gateway. But, but actually we are much more than this. So let's explain why. The first one that we're doing, and you know, you as a customer, if you want to go to the microservices, you know how dynamic this ecosystem is, right? Stuff is, you know, it's not like monolithic when you have one thing that it stays forever, you know, and you're usually not touching it. In microservices, everything is so dynamic and agility. So you really, really need to make sure that you will be able to control it and, you know, to make sure that there is no errors and so on. And in order to do that, it's better just to automate all these processes. So one of the most important thing for us is to discover everything automatically and continue reinforce discovery, which means that you also know what's happening and we, we actually translate it to an invoice code by that. So we have three level discovery. The first one is infrastructure. So we're discovering every those infrastructure that exists, either it's Microsoft Azure or OpenStack or, or, or Amazon Web Services or Google or VMware, and we even discover and what's special about the Terraform is that if we discover it, we can actually know what is the port of the application that's running on it, which is really, really special. The other thing is that we're discovering every other platforms that exist on top of it. So either Kubernetes or, you know, an OpenShift and all the rest. Um, if we, once we discover the services or even discover the monolithic application, we're going and we're checking to see if they are supporting one of those technologies, either Swagger, GRPC, or GraphQL. Because if they are, we can actually get the description of the functions that are running on it. So a lot of, like for instance, we have a customer that running, uh, you know, on VMware, but most of his application is Java using Swagger. So we automatically discover everything that exists. And this is knowledge. This is, this is, this is will help us for after it. And I will explain why. For instance, because we know this, the signature, we can prevent DDoS attack. We can do a lot of magic because we kind of like, we are not, you know, there is a proxy level three, four, there is a proxy level seven. We kind of like on top of it. We kind of like looking inside and making some sense. We're running an AWS function. We're already putting the signature on top of it. As you can see, you shouldn't, as a client, I didn't need to do anything. Besides that, we also discover all the serverless function because that's kind of easy. It's a REST API call. We can get all the information and so on. So three level function, again, the point is that let's find, discover as much as we can and, and, and use this data. We also running on Envoy. So, I mean, Envoy is like, is like perfect because Envoy is exactly built for this ecosystem. The, 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 you know, the, the, the craziness of the microservices. And by the way, it was building specifically in Lyft in order to move from monolithic to microservices. So that was his main purpose. And it's also by the CNCF, it's written beautifully and it's really, really extensible in the right place. Uh, is again, it's like, it, and it's really important because if someone using Nginx and putting some control plan on top of it, um, the problem is that it's not really inside a proxy. So it's really hard for him to, you know, to prevent stuff like denial of service. But Envoy did a design that way that you can actually create a filter and this filter will make it, you know, it's basically you are part of Envoy. So you can actually make sure you have a lot of control. And it's run, as you can see, by a lot, a lot of organizations that's supporting it in production and running it late for production for a long, long time in crazy scale. So it's really, really, the, for my opinion, the best proxy exists today. But we didn't stop there because a lot of people taking Envoy and putting some control plan, there's nothing special about it. But we actually took it on us to actually invest in actually extend Envoy to specifically to focus on our function. 
So besides getting every envoy feature, like authorization, authentication, and traffic control, and analytic and monitoring and logging, we also wrote a lot of filters. And filters are not easy to write. It's like a C++ async, but we did that. So envoy feature that we open source by solo. We did everything function level routing. So we created a base filter that basically can um, be used and transform everything to work on the function level. We created a lot of serverless uh, a, a filter, one for AWS, one for Google, one for Azure, and all the others uh, on-prem solution. Uh, we did a transformation filter. As I said, this is the strongest and the most important filter that we created. And the reason is because, as I said, it's using us as a transformation, we mean, that, we mean that it's making us to be a real multiplexer. But more than this, it's also a validation filter, if you like, to think about that way. And we can prevent DDoS attack and a lot of other stuff because we know the signature and we have this transformation filter that know how it should look. We created a filter. Uh, we created a project called Squash that I will actually demo in a, in a few minutes. So I'm not going to go to it too, too much, but it's the ability to actually uh, debug, for real debug, like a touch debugger to a microservices or anything actually running on production in our in service mesh. Um, and then NATS filter. So it was really important to us to basically bring event to, you know, to, to, uh, to the other ecosystem of the, you know, of microservices and, 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 uh, and monolithic. So what we did, we basically chose NATS for now to beginning. And again, it's really, really hard a uh, filter because it's translating HTTP request to um, TCP request. But what it's giving us is first of all, we can deal with crazy, crazy scale right now. It's giving us fed out, it's giving us persistent, it's giving us a lot of very, very strong uh, tooling because we're using this great um, great thing. And that is, by the way, part of the CNCF. Um, and, uh, and the last thing is that we also have, one of them is the caching. I think that it's really, really important, specifically when we gluing environment like in pro a cloud provider, so, so imagine that I can actually cache the request to AWS. Now I don't need to pay them. This is huge, right? So we created a three-level uh, caching, caching inside Envoy, caching in Redis, and caching in GRPC. And we also doing a, did a lot of filter on the level of the security. We also created some tools. So we did Squash, and we'll talk about it after it. We, we did an Envoy operator. It's kind of like an installer. It's based, so it's based on the... A oper the operator framework by CoreOS and now Reddit actually. Um, so we actually did an Envoy operator for this. You can look at it as a, a, a installer for, a, for a Kubernetes or OpenShift. And we also created a tool that will help us to build it. So what the tool is doing is basically can build Envoy, can build Glue, can build them separately, and can also build and, and install the, the supporting features in that, maybe you want us to deploy that for you. So this is again an open source uh, tools that we created, um, but we didn't, you know. But still, we need to manage that somehow. And I think what's special about our design is how extensible it is and how really it's integrated with your infrastructure. It's not not for, for it's for real. The way to actually working, there is three parameters that we care. One of them is the secret. The other one is auto discovery, and the other and the last one is user configuration. For secret, we're supporting right now Vault and CRDs in OpenShift or or in a, a Kubernetes. All the discovery, I show you how much we discovered before, and user configuration, we're basically using the storage because we are stateless of either console, OpenShift, or just a YAML file. So what Glue is doing is basically watching it. That's it, it's watching these three things. And then something happened and one of them changed. And Glue getting all the information, it doesn't know anything. It really don't. It's just sending it to the plugin. And the plugin, there is a lot of plugin, and they're looking at this, and they're taking the piece that's relevant to them, and they're basically translating it to an Envoy configuration. They're bringing, aggregating all the data, creating the configuration, and be using the Envoy V2 API, which means that it's all kind of like gRPC, very secure, very quick. You saw that in the demo. And basically, it's kind of watching us. And then it's getting the configuration, and we're all set. Uh, so this is basically the, the advantage of this one is that right now, if we want to add a new feature, for instance, we don't need to change glue whatsoever. The only thing we need to do is to basically write a plugin and maybe filter. So we don't have an API. Right? Basically, what we do have is extensible, if you think, extensible language. Um, so that's that. Uh, so, okay, so now let's go back to the demo. Now I think we kind of 
like understand that you know, what I actually did in the demo. So we want to do an hybrid app, right? And this is how it's working. So now it's really simple for me to do something like this. I can come in an application and define an application that the domain is calc.com and each function is going to go to different function per se, right? Some of them in monolithic, some of them in microservices, some of them in serverless. Um, okay, so that's great. That's awesome, now we can do that, but wait. So now we have this three um, application that built from three different type of application. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to actually metrics, you know, collect the metrics in three different places or look at the logging to a different technology or any other of this stuff? It doesn't make a lot of sense. So we need to fix that. And this is the way I see the ecosystem, right? There is monolithic microservice and serverless, and this is the tooling that usually people use. So let's start with their metrics. There is Prometheus, there is CloudWatch in that, in that example and an APM. But think about it. We are actually invoking every function that exists in this ecosystem, in this application, which means that we only do from AWS, for instance. So what we do, we basically created a service that every 10 minutes of fluid, this is configurable, is going and sucking the right information and bringing it all to one place. So right now it's permitted, but to be fair, we don't care. It can be that, whatever you want. Whatever um, metrics tool you want, we will be able to feed the information there. Same thing with open tracing, and this is actually more interesting, because think about it. Think about a span of open tracing, but this, you know, the, 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 micro, the, the pieces there on the spam are actually from different type of application. They are not only microservices. There could be a function in monolithic and function in microservices and serverless function. So again, we're taking everything and we're sucking all the one place so that the user can actually have a real kind of like view for everything. In debug, we actually know this before we even started working on it, that there is a problem already in debugging, right? Debugging is actually microservices, it's a really hard problem. So that's why we, we wrote Squash and I will show, it, it, you know, that's the next demo, so I will show you that. In terms of architecture, what event-driven is versus, right? So we're basically saying you can choose, and very simply what to use. Do you want to do it in event-driven, or do you want to do microservices? We're giving you all the structure for that. Now we're talking about deployment. So yeah, I don't really want you to go to three different deployment tools. What you really need to do is to create kind of like something that you can think about like an Elm chart, like an Elm for cross-platform or Ansible for cross-platform. So this is something that we will. And the other thing, if I wanted to test right now, what I really want to do is I want, you know, I want some framework. I mean, it will really going to be great when I will do the Canary deployment and Blue Green and so on. But before that, what I want to make sure is that it's actually working we, we, we wrote a framework that basically running this with the monolithic application, then running it with the, the same function with the, in the microservices, and then assert that you're getting the same result. So even before you deploy, they just verify that you have a framework that's working. So that's that. So let's show a, a quick demo of Squash. Let me just one sec. So the environment in AWS. And don't worry about what I'm showing here because I'm not showing anything. This is only for me, okay? So I'm spinning up the demo right now in AWS, it will take a sec. So Squash is one of the example of, uh, of the thing that we build in order to kind of like make sure that you can glue this the thing. So, okay, so this is a microservice application that I wrote. It's really, really simple. It's basically getting two parameters and then it either Add or subtract. So let's just put number, it doesn't really matter which one, and just do calculate. What you can do to see that it's not working because 91, 99 plus 11, it's not 88. So what people usually doing when that's happening? I will tell you what they do, they're printing because they have no other way to do that. Debugging is not something that people are doing in microservices, they're doing it in monolithic application. In microservice, they're taking logs and they troubleshoot it. So if they're running is the development, they can just Go to the code and they say this say command and you know and build up an a, a shift and then they will look the log. If they're running production even more a little bit complicated, they probably use something like open tracing and then they will need to wait until 10 minutes until the logs is aggregated and then they will try to troubleshoot it. So we think that it could be better. What we did, besides getting excited about the new version, is we created basically this is. The, the, the microservices uh, application that we wrote. It's really simple. It's basically serving the HTML. It's reading in Go. Right now you can see it in, um, in a Visual Studio code. Basically it's getting the two parameter that someone is printing, then it's sending it to a different microservices here, reading in Java. 
you can see very, very simple running here in IntelliJ, showing in IntelliJ. And what you can see is that the only thing that he's doing is basically taking the two parameters that he got from the Go microservices, adding or subtract it, and returning the value. So now, what we did is we basically created an extension. So when you're actually creating control command shift, when you write, you can actually get some command. So squash debug container is the one that we will choose for now. And what you can see is that it went to the open shift and basically suck all the pods that are running that I can see. Okay, so let's choose one of them, the first one, for instance, because it's service one, right? And then he tell me, look, there is one container in this, uh, in this pod. Do you want to debug it? I said, yes. They said, okay, which debugger do you feel like attacking? And I will do DLV because it's reading it go. So this application is running right now on AWS. And as you can see, I'm starting to debug it. Let's do the same thing right now on the other IDE microservices. Same thing, squash, debug container. Again, and bring me all the list of the pods. I'm going to teach the service two in that case. And I will take the container that's running inside of it and I will attack the Java debugger because that's what the code is doing. Okay, cool. So now the only thing that I really need to do is go back to my application and send the calculator again. What do you see is that I'm seriously debugging it right now live in AWS. So I can go inside. What will happen when I will actually next jump? It will jump to the other microservices, right? And you can see it's just working. I'm coming here and I'm continue. And you can see that ops one equal 99, that's correct. You continue, ops two is equal 11, again, correct. Is that equal true? It's all correct. But look what I did here. I specifically introduced a bug here. I did that, is that a true? I want you to do minus. But this is a debugger. So let's just change it on runtime to false. Changing false, I'm going to continue it. It will jump back here because I put a breakpoint and I will continue it here. And now you discover is that that fixed the problem. So again, very, very simple way to do that. We also created the filtering envoy for that. And what's happening is that once basically there is a lot of 500 internal errors or something like this, we can actually uh, shadow the request outside the cluster and basically start debugging it there. So this is Squash, I hope you like it. And go use it, it's all open source. So go to the solo repository and you will see all of this open source. Um, okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so so basically, I mean, basically there's one want to just uh, summarize what we're doing. Uh, so we, we're doing very well. I mean, we're talking in a lot of conference, the open source community love us, which is fantastic, fantastic for us. We really like it. We we've been working with the community for a long, long time, and it's really great to be part of it. Um, we, we, we have partnership, we have inbound marketing that is crazy, and we're doing very well. And I think that right now we'll take the question if there is any. Well, it, it, I think um, you have done, um, you have done, oops, we've got some echo. We've got some echo. Yeah. Let me just turn off some extra speakers. No worries. Um, I think I think you've just done probably the best presentation explaining the value proposition for serverless that I've seen so far. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of other people have talked open WISC, open FAS. Um, you know, I've heard all kinds of talks over the past you know six to seven months that this has been really taking off, and um, I I think that one of the things that that people don't realize it is, uh, you know, you talk about the big bang and the different architectures is, is that um, how much effort goes into lifting and shifting those legacy things mm -hmm. and not getting the benefit of it. And I think you've shown us really how you can get the benefit by using this, um, the serverless frameworks and, and some of your tooling. So I uh, really appreciate that. Um, Thank the, you so much. Uh, yeah. The, and as I said, what I didn't say, important is that it's all running natively on OpenShift. Uh, you can go to our website, which I'm going to show you in a second. And actually, where is it? I think it will be here. And you can see the, the instruction to actually install it on OpenShift. And the beauty of it is that, as I said, the platform of choice, right? I mean, you can run everything. Yeah. And, and I think this is great. Yeah. This, this is awesome. And um, I think the, you know, especially the the extension of Envoy and using that is, is really um, very important to a lot of our, our user base who are taking a look at um, how they can move and take advantage of these frameworks. So it's really 
wonderful to see this um, take off so fast as it is. I know you're off to, to DockerCon. Um, yeah, the, I'm doing the keynote there, and we will announce something very, very cool. So okay, well, we, we will all be looking forward mm -hmm. to that. Um, there's also you said you're based in Boston. Um, there's a serverless track and a small. Um, conference called DevConf US in August that I'll send you some information to as well because I think this would fit in really nicely with um, some of the stuff that they're talking about there as well. So and that that one you won't have to travel for. So no, that's great. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I, I think you've um, maybe given them so much to think about that uh, <laughs> they have to go back. The other thing that I was going to maybe pop over to the um, Envoy operator page because um, the yeah. operator framework, which just got um, right. open sourced at KubeCon in Copenhagen is, is very near and dear to our hearts. And, and really I wanted to make sure you gave a plug for, for the work that you're doing there as well. Um, and, and it's much appreciated um, by yeah. all of us, um, whether at Red Hat and the CoreOS team too. So that was a- Yeah, the CoreOS uh, team is great, so. They, yeah. they, they've been wonderful. And I think this is um, gonna be a big part of the next gen of um, where we're going to is the whole operator framework. So um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely have more on the operator framework coming up soon in other OpenShift Commons briefings, so we'll have you back. And I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how, you know, like we have a Docker registry and all this, how we get all of these operators that are all over the place into some way, right. some some central registry. I, and, and, um, yeah, I think they have some. I think that Brandon Phillips, if he asked me to, to wrote one. I think they have something. It, it's uh, yeah. yeah. I haven't I haven't seen it exactly, but I think that's when what I'd love to see is to get all the people from Couchbase to you to Brandon um, together to talk about um, how to build these operators, how to use the SDK, and you know feedback on all of that and get that um, that conversation rolling too, because there's lots of other things that we need operators. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's great. I mean, as I said, we will have to help. By the way, we are we have a very very knowledgeable team, small but. Uh efficient <laughs> and we would love to contribute and help i think what we're doing what the, the guy reddit is doing is amazing and we would love to be part of it perfect well will thank you very much and um thank everybody who's listening and if you can put up your um that your resources page or maybe the the top of your github for um yeah. installing maybe your website something something how to get a hold of you is the page that we're yeah. looking for now and yeah, um, website. You can go there and you find a lot of the resources and links there. All right, perfect. That's a great way to end. Um, good luck with your keynote at DockerCon. We'll be listening in and um, re remotely because um, I'm not traveling. <laughs> not, not trying not to travel this month. There's enough to go to next month. Yeah. And hopefully we'll see you in uh -huh. Boston um, sometime soon. Yeah, maybe. thank you. Maybe you. All right, take care and thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.